Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Monica Hubbard. I'm with Unified Trust, and I, along with my co-host, Karen Hortney, audit partner, and Rick Cundy, senior financial advisor from Cherry Beckert, will be conducting the fiduciary training program this morning. I wanted to provide you a brief introduction to Unified Trust. We actually are a national trust company, and through our advisor partners, we serve retirement plan clients throughout the country. Our mission is to improve financial outcomes of the participants we serve. We have the results and data to prove it, and we know that our success comes from our unique discretionary trustee role to the plan, which is always to put the interests of our clients first. To give you a brief, a brief background uh, about myself, um, I actually am a retirement consultant. I've been in the industry for many years. However, I'm most proud of my work as the former vice chairperson and investment committee chairperson of the Kentucky Deferred Compensation Authority's 401k and 457 plans. Uh, when I left, they totaled approximately $2 billion in assets and $100,000 or 100,000 uh, 100, participants. Uh, the reason I mentioned that in that role, I too was a plan fiduciary like you, so I truly understand the importance of the work you do. So first of all, thank you for your time and more importantly for your commitment to becoming a more informed and knowledgeable retirement plan steward. I imagine for most of you, <laughs> managing your company retirement plan is a very small part of your overall job responsibilities. However, your role as a plan steward is a very important one. Since for majority of your employees, their retirement plan will be their primary source of income in retirement. So the decisions you make today and in the future impact the retirement future for both you and your employees. While that responsibility does sound daunting, uh, the good news is that once you understand your responsibilities and know how to carry out those duties, you'll be well equipped to navigate the fiduciary world with confidence. Uh, one other thing that I want to follow up with regards to the polling question or the questions in general, um, we will do our best to answer the questions as we go along. Uh, but if we're not able to get to them all, we will follow up with an email response. So every question will get answered eventually. So um, the learning objectives, uh, I, just so you know, I believe everybody on this call is capable of reading, so I won't read what the learning objectives are. Uh, but just so you know, by attending the webinar, as it indicated, you're eligible for continuing education credit. And as she indicated, you'll receive a copy of the presentation slides, FI360 Investment Steward Handbook, and a certificate of attendance. By attending this program, you actually also are eligible to take a full self-study course through FI360, which is approximately three hours long uh, and culminates in a final exam. If you decide to go through this program and pass the test, you'll receive a certificate of completion from FI360 stating that you've become a fiduciary essentials defined contribution plan uh, fiduciary uh, program. And the cost of this program actually is normally $250 if you were to contract directly with FI360. However, due to the generosity of Cherry Becker, they are sponsoring this event and therefore it is free. So now let's get forward with the training. Um, the next is the required disclosure compliance. So let's get on to the next slide. Um, most likely that <laughs> there are many of you, uh, they're not old enough to remember the make of this car, the Studebaker. Um, and you're also probably wondering if even if you knew what the car model was, why it is included in the fiduciary training presentation you're attending today. Well, believe it or not, this car maker had a lot to do with the passing of ERISA. Um, interestingly enough, um, in 1963, uh, Studebaker went out of business, uh, laying off 4,400 workers in South Bend, Indiana. It was interesting for the two years pre-1963, so starting in 1961, uh, Studebaker was having financial problems, um, and they decided they needed to invest in a new model of a car. Um, unfortunately, they did not have the cash flow to do so. So as they were looking around for money, somebody said, hey, we have a bunch of money over here in the defined benefit plan. Why don't we use that, and then when we make money, we'll replace it and pre or refund the uh, assets of the defined benefit plan. Well, as you can see, they didn't do that because in fact they closed their doors in 1963. So all that money that had been set aside for the interest and use of the participants in retirement, in fact, was gone. So those 4,400 employees left with no money 
uh, for their future retirement. And considering the time, understand in 1950, 1940, 19, you know, 30, all the way really until 1980s, the defined benefit plan was the plan of the day. Um, that was their retirement account. There was no ability to have a 401k plan where they could put in pre-tax dollars. So in 1972, actually there was an expose, kind of like a 60 minutes, called Pensions, the Broken Promise, where they summarized the Studebaker situation along with several other employers, unfortunately, that did similar things with their defined benefit plans. And lawmakers took notice, and actually in 1970, uh, for we had the passage of ERISA. Uh, so ERISA is the principles by which we all on this call today as fiduciaries, uh, those are the principles, principles that we must follow that govern the actions and the things that we do with regards to our retirement accounts. The reason I mentioned this is because if you look, ERISA came into play in 1974 and yet the predominant plan of the day, which is a 401k plan actually did not come into being until 1981 when they enacted the cash or deferred option. So you'll so the reason I bring this up is because as we go along and talk about some of the precepts and some of the guidelines by which you as a fiduciary must follow and act, they don't make a lot of sense. And the reason that is 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 that they were really designed to fix the sins of the defined benefit world. But unfortunately, we can't get rid of ERISA. <laughs> so at some points, we're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. And we'll be talking through that as we go through the presentation today. So what does fiduciary mean? Well, fiduciary rules, regulations, and, and, and principles have been around uh, for 4,000 years. Um, in fact, fiduciary principles have provided the foundation for civilization and government throughout history. With ERISA, these principles were made into law and applicable to retirement accounts. In general, if you're in a position where you can make or influence investment, administrative, or financial decisions regarding your plan, you might most likely are considered to be a fiduciary to that plan. So under ERISA, there are basically two core fiduciary duties that you must follow. The first is the duty of loyalty which means that you must first and foremost act in the sole interest of the participant. That is a guiding principle that if you can remember that and only that from today's presentation, I have to always do what's right by the participant. Your guiding principle will get you through almost any decision. The second one is the duty of care, which is actually more focused on process. Um, and it really says that you must be competent. It requires the fiduciary to act with the same level of care, skill, prudence, and diligence that an expert would when charged with the same duty. So as the plan fiduciary, if you do not feel like you have the time, the interest, and or knowledge to meet the prudent standard rule, it is highly recommended that you seek out an expert to assist you. And in fact, some would even suggest that it is required if you were talking to an attorney, in fact. Um, so the best way, though, if you want to navigate this world is to partner with a plan fiduciary. And I'm going to introduce Rick now, who is going to introduce you to the type of different type of fiduciaries there are in the marketplace and how they might help you mitigate the risk in this industry or in this world. Thank you, Monica. Appreciate that. Uh, first of all, when, when dealing with ERISA, I always think about it, uh, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. I also heard of it as every rotten idea since Adam, but bear that bear with me on that one. So the universal plan fiduciaries, kind of the, the plan sponsor, who's the business owner, the retirement committee members, the investment manager, the person or company responsible for managing investments on behalf of a financial institution for clients, and the advisor are kind of three parties uh, that we'll discuss a little bit. The financial advisor, kind of a best practice here, you want to make sure that you have an advisor competent in the retirement plan marketplace, one who actually accepts the fiduciary status and responsibility. We'll look at the next slide, Monica. So let's just talk about fiduciary status. Let's look at fiduciary status, what makes you a fiduciary, and different fiduciary types. So, you know, every company that has a plan is required by law to have at least one named fiduciary designated for that plan in a legal sense. 
secondly, those who exercise discretion over plan assets, you know, making investment decisions, are also by default considered fiduciaries. The retirement committee it would be here. Um, the third one would be if you have the ability or authority to appoint others as co-fiduciaries. This also constitutes a fiduciary duty. For example, the CEO or the business owner of a company who appoints members of the investment committee is, you know, as a, is a fiduciary, as well as each of the committee members. And then finally, the one I want to talk about a little bit that really people are not aware of someone is the, called the functional fiduciary. Um, simply by performing a fiduciary function, you know, it, it can apply even without the individual realizing it. So it's really important to understand anyone wishing to avoid fiduciary status needs to understand what lines not to cross. So to, to illustrate that, you know, suppose you had a payroll manager handling, handling administrative matters, but they delay making timely deposits. You know, that's not necessarily a breach. However, they control the financial decision, you know, regarding plan assets. Um, you could also, you know, if you just mentioned casually, you know, how to invest, helping a participant make a, you know, investment decision. So really have to kind of be uh, alert to all those. So with that control, they become a fiduciary, even though they're not actually on the committee. So if we now talk about, you know, the, the different types, um, you know, we've already mentioned about someone in the company as a named fiduciary. But as the named fiduciary, if you don't feel like you can carry out the fiduciary duties that ERISA requires, delegating that to an expert is recommended. Uh, many times in ERISA cases, in court cases, they will say that ignorance is not a defense. So, you know, the other terms that you hear quite often are 321 and 338. And so a 321 advisor is they simply provide investment guidance on investments. You know, they, they'll represent to you fund lineup changes or, or give you a suggestion. However, the plan fiduciaries of the investment committee have the responsibility still. They're simply advising where the, you know, the investment committee plan fiduciaries has the decision making. If you go up that chain to a 338 fiduciary, they actually take the responsibilities for you know, all the investments uh, related to the plan investments. Therefore, the investment responsibility has been delegated. Um, just know that that, you know, that that delegation, such as a 321 or 338, those terms you always you know, hear put around, it's a contractual arrangement, and, and the devil's always in the details. So it's important to really know you know, what fiduciary status your advisory partners assume. The last one up here, the warranty of directed trustee, um, you know, that, that's a, a very common thing. There, there are different um, f called fiduciary warranties. I think it's pretty interesting. That there are no court cases showing that a vendor's fiduciary warranty has ever protected a plan sponsor. Uh, the warranties are typically you know, offered by large insurance companies um, and sold at no extra cost, but they exclude most allegations of misconduct, especially fee-based issues. Um, they really just kind of cover the, you know, the plan lineup. Um, so in short, the fiduciary warranty mostly may be an empty sales gesture, adding little, if anything, to the safety or security of plan participants, and definitely does nothing to protect the plan sponsor. Uh, the directed trustee, you know, I guess you would mostly with banks, you'll hear about a directed trustee. They'll say they are a trustee. But again, being a directed trustee, they're simply taking direction, you know, from you. So again, you're still on the hook. Um, so one of the things you want to make sure of is, is what is the actual fiduciary status of your advisors, your, your different advisor partners? And, and it's always your, important to see that, you know, how they'll carry out their duties, that you monitor their duties, if there are any exceptions or exclusions, uh, you know, that in turn will be back on your plate, you know, as the name fiduciary. So I'd like to turn it back over to Monica. She's going to give you a, a personal story from the time when she was a, a trustee at the, with the Kentucky Deferred Comp Plan that kind of pretty well illustrates these points. Thank you, Rick. Uh, yeah, it's actually a very interesting story. So um, I was appointed by the governor to uh, sit on this board, and I was very excited about the opportunity. Um, and, uh, you know, a couple years in, they named me chairperson of the investment committee. Um, and if you look at my bio, which you probably have not, but it, it, I'm clearly not an investment professional by, by trade. So I was quick to ask the board to look at one providing us a substantial amount of life insurance, or I mean our liability insurance on us personally, 
But more importantly, I said, I we really think that we need to seek out a professional, an investment professional that will take on the fiduciary liability of, of making the selections of the mutual funds uh, and, and doing all the work around that. So we did a national search of all the big advi you know, advisory firms in the country, started off with 10, whittled to six, personal interviews with three, and I sat across uh, the table from all three of them since I was chairperson and the person who'd be signing the minutes uh, and therefore would be the first on the lawsuit if there was uh, one to occur, that I asked specifically, I do not want to be a fiduciary. Will you be a fiduciary? Because I don't want to be personally liable for the investment decisions of this $2 billion plan. And the three vendor partners, which I will remain nameless, all said, Monica, we will in fact be a fiduciary. Don't worry. Uh, so we moved forward, selected one, and it wasn't until I had the opportunity to work at Unified Trust, which we are very focused on the issue of fiduciary, became much more educated about the difference, the nuances between a 321, a 338, and named fiduciary. And the, the moral of the story is everybody can be a fiduciary. It's what they do uh, within that fiduciary contract or what they truly agree to do. So when they answered the question, yes, Monica, we will be a fiduciary to the plan. In fact, all three of them come to find out were being 321 fiduciaries, which basically meant that they were going to provide guidance and not liability uh, assumptions. So uh, it, it's, the, it's the devil in the details, and it's honestly, I didn't know to ask the right question, which was, um, which was an eye-opening aha moment for me being in the industry. So, uh, so I thought it'd be an interesting question uh, for the next uh, for our first polling question of the day. Um, do you know uh, what fiduciary status your provider and/or and advisor assumes? And I would say from my story I just told you, it's okay to say you might not know. <laughs> um, but so we'll, uh, the poll is now open. We'll allow for, I think, about 20, 30 seconds for everybody to please answer, and then we will show you the results. I, I'd like to add something, too, while we're, we're getting the polling information in. Uh, Rick indicated about the directed trustee. Um, I'd also like to share with you another example. It's very common. Um, all the big providers in general provide a directed trustee service. That basically means that they're responsible for making sure the assets get from when they're deposited into the account of the actual participant. So they're trustee to make sure of asset management only or control of that asset for a very short period of time. So it really uh, is a very, very um, watered down status and really doesn't provide you anything from the actual investment issues. I think the poll is getting ready to share the poll results now. Okay, I I'm going to move forward. I'm not exactly sure uh, where the polling information has gone. Um, so my next thing is let's talk about, and we'll get back to the polling once we figure out the um, the results of that. So um, fiduciary obligations, why should you care? Um, I'm actually sure most of you did not want or even know that you're a fiduciary to your company's retirement plan due to your job function or title. Um, also, I imagine that if you, if I asked you privately, do you have a complete understanding of what you're expected to do as a plan fiduciary? My, most likely you would say no. And yet you're expected to manage it as if you're an expert in this area. So the reasonable question I get a lot is, Monica, why should I care? 
you know, it is not my full-time job. And in fact, it's a very small fraction of it. And besides that, I don't even own the company. Unfortunately, as we've established, if you have influence over plan decisions, you are a fiduciary. And now more than ever, fiduciaries are facing increasing secure, uh, scrutiny as well as accountability. And here is the catch. Your liability for being a plan fiduciary is personal. Let me say that again. <laughs> personal, and it pierces the corporate shield. So everyone on this call, regardless if you're an owner, an HR manager, retirement committee member, um, you have a vested interest in being a good fiduciary. Because not only is it in the best interest of your plan and the participants, but it's also in your best interest. So if you apply the sound and consistent processes that we're gonna go through today, there is, you'll actually be able to manage that risk and reduce it considerably. So let's go on to uh, a discussion about the Department of Labor. Um, this is becoming more and more of an issue in the sense that the Department of Labor was asking themselves, wow, I wonder if plan sponsors as a general really understand what's going on in the marketplace and understand their role as a fiduciary and if they're carrying out their duties prudently. Um, so they did a study of plan, plan sponsors and discovered that they lacked what they felt the necessary education and training to carry out their fiduciary duties. In addition, they found plan sponsors also thought their vendor partners were, were relieving them a lot of their duties. Goes back to the, the comments that Rick made. Um, certain fiduciary statuses relieve liability and certain fiduciary statuses do not. Um, so therefore, uh, plan sponsors thought that in fact they were in a better circumstance than they were. And um, I think Rick did a quote, and I'm going to do a quote as well, um, from a judge in an ERISA lawsuit to the defendant, a good heart and an empty mind is not good enough to navigate the fiduciary world. Um, so it's very important uh, that uh, how do you navigate it then? Well, FI360 realized that it's a real challenge. I mean, if you look at ERISA, it's 2,000 pages long, and I don't think anybody on this call nor myself would like have, have any interest in studying it. Uh, to any extent. Uh, so FI360, um, which is really the industry standard for investment principal uh, stewards uh, guidelines, uh, came up with what they call forming the, uh, forming the global fiduciary precepts, um, which basically means, um, for those of you that may not be aware, ERISA actually is a process statute. You're gonna hear process a lot through the next few slides as we start talking more about specifics, about things you should be doing day to day to manage your retirement account. Um, so basically FI360 has outlined a comprehensive roadmap for plan sponsors to follow. Uh, so interestingly enough, while some people think that ERISA says you must have the cheapest plan with the highest performing funds, that in fact is absolutely false. ERISA says, you must have a reasonably priced plan with reasonable performance based upon the process and policies you've set in place. So let's figure out how to paint by numbers together uh, with regards to the global precepts. Okay, I'm gonna go to another polling question, <laughs> which is an easy one, and um, the poll is now open. So just curious, how often do you, you meet as a retirement committee and retirement committee by the way doesn't necessarily I think you should have a formal retirement committee which we'll talk about uh, but if your retirement committee is you the owner and your advisor how often do you meet if your retirement committee is your HR manager and your owner how often do you meet um, so how often do the group of individuals that have responsibility for the financial investment and administrative issues of the plan, how often do you get together formally and talk about the retirement account? Oh, and guess what, everybody? I now have uh, the responses, <laughs> so I just figured out where to do that. Um, I know the poll is going to be closing soon. Okay. 
So actually, uh, the poll results, um, actually 21% uh, do quarterly, uh, I commend you, 19 semi-annually, 27 annually, and the 33 says that you do not have a retirement committee uh, and do not formally get together on an ongoing basis. Um, so I, I, it's understandable. A lot of times, you know, my when I meet with plan sponsors, it's not something that's first and foremost on their mind. But as we go through this presentation, hopefully, um, you will see that there's a real uh, a real need to do that, and and why it's important that you formalize that process. Okay. So we're going to talk about the first paint by number global precept, which is precept number one, which is no standards, laws, and trust provisions. Um, the, obvious, the obvious starting point from my perspective for meeting this objective is to gather all relevant plan documents. So if you printed off your PDF and want to take some notes for the next few slides, these are we're going to give you tips and things that you should do, and this is one of them. So um, I highly recommend you gather all relevant plan documents, which are including but not limited to the actual plan document, any board resolutions, adoption agreement, amendments, the actual loan policy if you have loans in the plan, uh, your investment policy statement, your vendor advisor service contracts, your fee contract uh, disclosures, your vendor contract, so if you're with a insurance company, for example, they normally have you sign a contract, um, and the actual participant online calculator disclosures, which we're going to talk about later, but it's very important for you to gather as well. But having them neatly in one place is not enough, and neatly in one place, I highly recommend either you create a online document vault, or I would suggest that you uh, create a hard copy binder so that that binder or iPads with the uh, electronic document vault uh, come to every meeting that you hopefully will be having going forward. Um, but have them neatly in, in one place is not enough. Each fiduciary must actually have a good understanding of the provisions and laws that govern their plan. So they should have easy access to these documents so that in the event a question arises from a plan or from a participant, an auditor, um, or if you're asked to actually produce them for an audit, hopefully not a DOL audit, um, you'll have them readily available at the, at the tip of your fingers. Um, I would like to mention one other thing with regards to knowing plan provisions. Um, obviously on a retirement committee, you have people that have specialties, i.e. your HR person, your person that's controlling payroll, controlling money flow in and out. That person is especially important for them to understand the plan provisions related to compensation, loan policy, contributions, anything that's dealing with money in and out. The plan document adoption agreement governs how that operates. So it's really, really important um, that they have a good understanding of that. Um, actually, I'm going to call upon Karen. Um, she's a retirement plan auditor and has a tremendous amount of experience in the industry and I'm probably unfortunately has, has seen her fair share of errors. Um, so Karen, I was wondering if you could share with the, with the group, um, what are the common types of errors you find when performing audits of retirement accounts? Great. Thanks, Monica. Yep, I live and breathe uh, all of this information that you just mentioned. Um, part of Part of our audit process is to work with plan management to gather uh, all of the governing documents um, as we're beginning each year's annual audit, um, just to ensure that we're working off of the latest and greatest plan provisions for purposes of the audit. Uh, we find a lot of times that uh, plan sponsors may not have that organized, like you mentioned, uh, in one central location, so I definitely recommend um, you know that and and keeping things up to to date and adding and deleting as you know needed um, we certainly find uh, in working through plan audits uh, quite a few issues uh, where the plan operations are deviating from the governing agreements and um, some of the the main items that we certainly see are surrounding the eligible compensation definition that's included in the governing documents. Um, that could include errors on the participant deferrals themselves, um, or if there's a separate definition used for um, the company 
matching or profit sharing contribution. Uh, we, we commonly see errors just surrounding uh, that definition being applied properly, uh, whether payroll's in-house or even um, you know, managed externally by a payroll third-party administrator. Uh, we also see uh, you know, issues like Monica mentioned surrounding uh, loans and loan policy violations. Also, just the timing of, of uh, folks entering the plan, their eligibility entry dates, uh, if those are not properly uh, you know, documented and, and written out, it's hard for your third parties to, to manage those properly. Um, of course, one of the most common issues that we see is uh, employers not depositing the contributions from their participants timely into the plan itself. Uh, so we see that as a, as a common issue that needs to be reported within the plan's financial st statements as well. So I, you know, just in order to wrap this one up, I would just say setting up not only your governing documents in a nice central location, but then setting up good internal controls in order to routinely check the governing document against how the plan is operating, just to be sure that not only internally within the plan sponsor, but your third-party administrators are properly operating in, conduct, in, con, in conjunction with your plan provision. And I'll turn it back to you, Monica. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Great advice about the internal controls. I totally agree. Um, I would like to mention one other thing as a follow-up to our compensation definition. I want to share a quick story. Um, a common one we see, a common error that we see, which is easily overlooked would be like I'm having a Christmas party and I give everybody $50 cash. Um, just make sure your compensation definition within your plan document uh, jives with that because in fact it may require that you actually run it through payroll, have withholding, and in fact have a deferral withheld. So those are the types of things that you wouldn't necessarily think of, oh, 401k error, um, but those are the type of examples that can uh, can arise unexpectedly. And lastly, I'm going to just put this one out there just because I've seen it recently. Uh, please make sure you sign your adoption agreements when they send them to you in your mail, as well as those amendments. I know you probably get them on your desk and other things fall on top, but uh, that, that's very important because it sets uh, the date by which uh, all provisions apply. And more importantly, it does set the legal clock running, which is more importantly as well. So thank you very much, Karen, for your insight. Appreciate that. Okay, this next precept to diversification, uh, this is one of those uh, square peg round hole. Uh, none of this is going to make sense, so we have had to adapt and adjust. So uh, remember, ERISA became law in 1974. At that time, as I mentioned, the five benefit plans ruled the day. And they were managed by professionals because they were 100% employer funded. So the rule at that time was created to make sure that plan fiduciaries diversified their portfolios across multiple asset classes. So how does that rule apply in today's world? If you look around today, there are rare, uh, you know, we would all love to have a defined benefit pension plan if we could, but most companies do not. Um, so now we're in the world of 401k plans. And in the world of 401k plans, we're in a world of self-directed participant, self-directed assets. So as I've talked about, the general rule, as we have discussed, you, as, as you know, you as the plan fiduciary are liable for all aspects of the selection and monitoring of plan investments, unless you hire a good uh, independent fiduciary, the old DB model. But with the introduction of participant-directed assets, a safe harbor was needed and wanted by the industry to limit the liability of the plan sponsor. Um, and while 404C, which is the safe harbor we're talking about today, um, is an exception to the rule that you as the plan fiduciary are liable, or liable for the participant's investment decisions. Say that again. Technically, under the general ERISA rule, you are liable for all assets, all investment decisions. However, 404C has given you limited protection. Protection if you follow 404C. The problem is that's only part of the story. 404C is an all or nothing safe harbor. It's a process. Again, I told you to hear process a lot. You'll continue to. Um, and therefore, if you don't diligently follow the process of good, sound investment management processes, you may not get the 
full blanket protection that 404C offers. To qualify for the safe harbor, 404C, you must comply with the requirements, which are requirements for investment selection, plan administration, and plan and investment disclosures. We'll be covering all these topics going forward, um, so in the slides ahead. Uh, so we're really going to focus on the one that most plan sponsors as a general rule neglect. In order to get to liability protection, each participant must have access to enough information about each investment option so that they can make an informed investment decision. The issue is what is enough? And is that different for every employee? And does that change year over year? And does that change when the market changes? The DOL clearly states in its regs that to meet 404C compliance, you're not required to provide investment advice. In fact, hear me on the phone, every plan sponsor, HR manager, do not provide any participant advice because then you fall over into now being a fiduciary at a participant level, not only at the plan level. Um, but they did, a DOL did actually issue an interpretive bulletin that encourages, strongly encourages you to offer investment education. So best practice tip, if you want the full faith and credit of 404C protection, document, document, document your investment process. So as we go forward, you know, everybody thinks of the investment process as a plan sponsor level issue. It is, but to get 404C protection, which protects you from participant liability, you must document, document, document. So that documentation process and the management of that is actually a two-layer protection process. So I would, keep, I would suggest you keep records of materials provided, records of all of the enrollment and education materials. Obviously, that can be online, archived, et cetera. Uh, but more importantly, I would rec re uh, recommend that you record uh, your, uh, preferably get an attendance sheet for any and all enrollment meetings and education meetings. So if you keep good records, uh, consider it a jail-free, you're at a jail-free card if the participant tries to sue you for losses sustained uh, by them in investing in their 401k account. Um, I, this is a cautionary tale. Reason I say that, we've had, uh, what, how many years of an up market now? Um, please understand that, uh, Rising tides float all boats. Uh, if you've lived through the 2008 market uh, adjustment, you'll know that participants do feel those things. So uh, it is in your best interest as a fiduciary to protect yourself and your participants by making sure that they are well informed of the investments that they're uh, placing their money in. And that is really where you need to make sure your advisor, uh, vendor partner, et cetera, is helping you do that because that should be in a very important job uh, for the plane. So this is where it also gets tricky. Believe it or not, if you look at the ERISA and the precept of diversification, uh, FI 360 actually then went so far as to say, what are the hierarchy of decisions that must be made to meet the diversification requirement, which is precept number two? Um, unfortunately, <laughs> it's not easy because um, diversification isn't just picking fun. It's a hierarchy of decisions. And basically, if you're looking at this, I'm sure it'll be a surprise to many of you that choosing the actual investments is the least important decision. Instead, the most important factor is the collection uh, time horizon, collective time horizon of the participants in the plan. Now you're probably thinking, I don't understand why that matters, Monica. Well, again, because the law was protect, passed to protect the sins of the defined, or correct the sins of the defined benefit beneficiaries or fiduciaries. So within that context, it makes sense because within a DB plan, you need to manage the assets to cover the pension distribution needs at the point in time when the money flowing out of the plan is more than what is coming in from contributions and anticipated growth. So you're probably saying, Monica, so how does that impact me? Because I'm in a 401k plan. Well, this is a real but not commonly recognized challenge for 401k plan fiduciaries. And unfortunately, time horizon is frequently overlooked and difficult to evaluate. And it's not easy, I'll be honest. Um, and this did become evident in 2008, which I just mentioned in the previous slide, with the market meltdown. 
as many retirees or near retirees suffered substantial losses anywhere from 30 to 40 percent um, because they were much more heavily uh, weighted in, in, in equities than they needed to be and they weren't aware, they didn't understand. So the implication of this is that many were forced to return to work or delay retirement for several years. So if time horizon had been more carefully considered in the education and the advisement process with the advisor, it is possible that many of these individuals would have been better protected and safer uh, investments designed to preserve assets rather than grow them at a faster, faster and riskier pace. So I've stressed the importance of time horizon as a dominant factor and, and developing the investment profile for the plan. So how do we solve the, this issue? Well, in early 1990, target date funds were created and actually they were created by Barclay, Global Investors, and now they are the predominant or dominant uh, investment alternative available in the marketplace. And obviously target date funds are funds that have an asset allocation mix, typically provides exposure to equities in early years when risk obviously is more, uh, is, has more applicability, um, and then becomes more increasingly conservative as time progresses and then therefore becomes an increasing weight to bonds, therefore more conservative. So with this structure of target date funds, it actually meets the basic principles of time horizon. So that was really the industry's answer to solve the question of how do we deal with the issue of time horizon. So this is actually now the predominant qualified default investment election or alternative, QDIA in the industry. So my question to you, knowing all what you know, or in the sense of all these things that must be taken into consideration for 404C, for time horizon diversification. The next polling question is, when you picked your target date series as the QDIA for your plan, what selection criteria did you use? Was it performance? Pick the best performing target date suite. Um, in suite, I mean Vanguard or uh, T. Price or et cetera. Fund expenses, glide path structure, or did you conduct a comprehensive participant demographic study and questionnaire? So the poll, poll is now open. Y'all are quick to vote, doing well. Looks like we have majority of the folks have voted. I will tell you that this has been a struggle for a lot of my plan sponsors. Um, if you think about it, I, I, while we're gathering the final uh, votes. Um, if you think about it, as we talked about at the very beginning, ERISA is a process statute, but it really has one core mission. It is to always put the participants' interests first. So if you look at the Department of Labor, um, when they look at ERISA and they look at retirement plan governance, they're always going to be more concerned about the non-highly compensated individual than the highly compensated individual. So for all my highly comps on the phone, so sorry, but that's the way it is. <laughs> um, so their interest is in the non-highly compensated. So when we say you must make the best, make the decisions for the best interest of the participant, we should probably go a little bit farther and say you actually should make the best interest for the non-highly compensated participant. So if you think about QDIA, the Qualified Default Investment Alternative, this is the investment that you generally put the mass participants in. It was designed to be easy, designed to be simple, designed to ensure that everybody got to, to an investment alternative that was well diversified and again had that time horizon issue we just discussed. The, pro the caveat to that is, if you look at the investment decisions that you make in your retirement plan, this is the number one in the sense of fiduciary liability. It is where all the money is. So wherever all the money is, is where all the liability is. 
So this is an incredibly important decision um, and, and one that is important that we all do well. Um, so as you can see, um, the hopefully everybody can see the, the uh, polling results, but 33% um, uh, use performance as their, their uh, criteria, primary criteria. 11 use fund expenses, small percentage use glide path structure, 6% uh, participant demographic, and 43% of all the above. Um, actually, uh, it's not the right answer, but the preferable answer is all of the above. Um, is, it, it, because ERISA has a process statute, performance should not be the guiding factor, nor should fund expenses. Um, it should be a combination of those things in addition to taking consideration of your collective participant base. So it's using the fundamentals of the DB concept that we just went over and applying it to your target date fund. So I will just put one caveat here, best practice tip. Um, if you are on a platform and you are using the proprietary target date fund of that platform, please make sure that you have documented why you are using that. And um, because you want to make sure that the investment alternative you use for your non highly compensated participants is not a function of this is where I am. It should be a function of this is in the best interest of the participants. So in some cases, the fund family's target date suite is not the best option for your participants. So document, 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 process, process, process. And I would say this is the one that I would highly recommend you document well. Okay, going on, let's go to the next slide. Prepare an investment policy statement. Uh, this is obviously pretty cut and dry, basic. Uh, although ERISA does not require an IPS, um, it does specifically require that investment policy be in place. So therefore, if you don't have a written formalized document, it's very difficult to show that you actually have a process in place. So uh, it's hard to meet the requirement of process. Therefore, uh, an IPS really is, is um, key. And I, I, interesting, the studies today, I think 90% of, or 90 of plan sponsors have them. So I'm, I'm not sure it's even a real issue anymore. But the one thing, best practice tip that I would highly recommend uh, that you take a look at uh, review and doc, uh, review and document compliance uh, with your IPS, IPS annually. So hopefully your advisor is bringing the IPS or it's part of your fiduciary file that you're reviewing at your committee meeting. Uh, but make sure that it is in compliance with the funds that are in your lineup. And also, this has come up recently in an interesting uh, article that was produced by an attorney um, that there is concern that a lot of the target date fund suites actually might violate the IPS. So make sure that the, your advisor is cross-referencing the investment policy statement to your target date fund usage to make sure that the target date fund is not doing something that would be in violation of your investment policy statement. Precept four, prudent experts. Um, Basically, you're required to conduct a comprehensive due diligence process when you select each service provider, and that includes platform provider and mutual fund managers. However, if you have a good advisor, hopefully they are in fact doing that selection and due diligence process in partnership with you and helping make sure that you have a consistent process outline and that you're documenting those decisions. Um, I truly, truly recommend in this space you really need an expert provider uh, or an expert advisor, uh, one that understands the industry. And I'm going to caveat here what I mean by expert. Um, make sure that your advisor has experience, has been in the industry for quite some time, that understands the retirement space, that a good, I would say at least 30 to 40 percent of their business is in the retirement world. They have designations in the retirement space. They have a team of experts behind them, like a Karen, um, that can help them navigate this space because it is ever-changing. And what you know today may not apply to you tomorrow. So um, this is really where I think it's really important. Um, 
Also, you want to make sure that the, the really the objective of this is this for the stewards is to ensure that the services are performed by qualified providers in a manner which is in the best interest of the participant. So again, delegating that to prudent experts is clearly um, helpful in this particular case. Okay, let's move on to the fifth global precept. We're five now out of seven, so we're we're, we're moving on through. Um, and and that this and precept really deals with the issue of controlling and, and accounting for investment expenses. The responsibilities of the plan steward are very clear in this area. In fact, it's very well documented. Uh, simply, you're required to know and understand all the fees. And all the fees, that means direct, indirect, visible to the participant and not visible to the participant which can also be referred to as embedded, all those expenses associated with the operation of your plan. As I mentioned, a lot of plan sponsors I've heard say, well, Monica, my objective, you know, I'm really supposed to get the cheapest or the lowest cost plan in the marketplace. That's what ERISA wants me to do. And as I've indicated before, in fact, that is not at all the case. ERISA requires you that your plan expenses must be reasonable in light of services provided. Therefore, be cautious when you're presented with a fee benchmark that does not include the detailed service listing that you're receiving, such as fiduciary service, face-to-face -face employee meetings, mid-year testing, payroll integration options, enrollment booklets, is there a cost, is there not a cost, plan design cost consultation, is there a cost, not a cost, am I going to be a fiduciary, yes, but is there a cost or not a cost. So cost alone is not a sufficient evaluation or benchmark of your plan expenses. You must look at it from a holistic perspective. Also, I have had many times, and I understand it, a concern by plan sponsors to say, well, I like this option because the participant doesn't see the fee. Even though the fees as a collective holistic perspective are more expensive. That, again, does not meet the fiduciary smell test. You must provide what is the best solution, best services for best pricing, regardless of how they are reflected. So historically, this industry has embedded fees because embedded fees appears to be free. But I don't think anybody on this phone call today, you're all owners of businesses, I don't think you give away your services for free neither does anyone in the 401k plan space. So understanding fees and helping participants understand fees, by the way, is gonna better position you so that you can make decisions free of that concern. You should not be making those decisions that I'm worried the participant's gonna know about the fee. There's always a fee. So best practice tips, conduct a comprehensive fee and service review. Please, please, please hire an independent advisor for this. It is not easy. I've been in this industry for 20 plus years and I still review contracts that I have to have several people look at because it is not easy to understand where the fees are. Ask your current provider to provide you a quote. If you write this down, please, if you take notes, this is one I think you should absolutely do. Ask your current provider to provide you a pure cost quote, which means that you want a quote that uses only non-revenue sharing funds, low cost or passive fund lineup, and an example would be provider A, I want you to only assume Vanguard funds when you price my plan for purposes of my benchmark. Why? Vanguard doesn't pay anybody to be on their platform. So the other provide, there's a lot of other mutual funds in the industry that do. So you can't really get the true cost of operating your plan. And lastly, um, if you use a stable value or GIC fund for the cash alternative in your plan, ask them to put that into a mutual fund for purposes of the fee. Uh, polling questions, we're gonna skip past this because we are running out of time and I, and I wanna be very respectful. I have five minutes left. So, uh, prudent experts, um, it is not uh, enough for you to just make prudent decisions. 
uh, you must actually also continue, or it is enough to make prudent decisions, uh, but it is the most importantly, uh, it is something that you must uh, do is to, uh, to ongoingly review those experts. Um, and as you do that re review process, uh, you must actually react to what you find. So best practice tip, if you find your provider is not acting in the best interest of your participants or not by doing something in violation of their contract or service promise, then you must act. You must actually ask them to either do something different or, in fact, uh, put them on notice that you may be looking for another uh, provider. Um, for an advisor partner relationship, annual investment review, um, so you should be having them relate to the IPS and provide all necessary documents. Your advisor partner relationship, they should be reviewing compliance testing and they should be having a fee and service discussion. So if they're not doing those things, um, then, then it's very important that you, uh, that you have that conversation and, and say that as uh, my responsibility as a fiduciary, I'm also monitoring you and I want you to continue to do the right thing. Conflicts of interest, this is, one, this is simple. If you think something isn't on the up and up, don't do it. If it doesn't pass the smell test, then don't do it. Um, it, it really is, if it makes good business sense, um, you know, do the right thing. Best practice tips, payroll and retirement plan services are more and more packaged and sold together today. I understand that. However, if you decide to move your payroll services to a company and they, then they say, well, hey, we'll not charge you that out of pocket because you know, you're moving your 401k plan to me. Um, guess what? The fees that are associated with the retirement plan most likely um, are absorbing or offsetting the fees associated with the payroll company. So, um, you know, please make sure that you do not have any of those decisions made together, and more importantly, that you're not putting them in a position where they will, you know, that that there's a question that you might have done something that wasn't on the up and up. So, the the next four slides are basically doing everything we just said. Organize. Make sure you put together a strong fiduciary file. Make sure you, everybody understands their roles and responsibilities. Formalize that, please. For those of you that have not put together some form of a retirement committee, please do so. Please meet at least annually and please uh, bring in an expert. Uh, take advantage of those safe harbors. 404C, as we've talked about, is a very important one. It's a participant level support. Make sure you have a good advisor that can help you document, 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 document. And more importantly, if you put all this information and processes in place and you don't monitor and continue to do the things you're supposed to be doing, it's all for naught. So make sure that you're a good steward, not only right now, but going forward. So takeaways, establish a formal retirement committee. Please do so because you can't document and prove to an auditor, to anyone else that you're doing the right things without, without, board, without minutes. Uh, create a fiduciary file which can, contains all related documents. Know what fiduciary role your advisor is assuming and what fiduciary role you have still left on your plate. Uh, request an updated, as I said, an updated quote with a no revenue share lineup with uh, no gigs and um, stable value. Review your participant investment construction for 404C. Let me put it another way. Fiduciary compliance is the sum of all your participants. You can have the best lineup in the world. But if all your participants are misusing it, then the reality is you've got probably issues down the road, especially if there's a market hit. Uh, and more important, and then lastly, review your participant online disclosures. In this industry today, participants receive their investment guidance or, more importantly, uh, wellness guidance with their online calculators. Make sure your advisor is reviewing that disclosure with you so you know what assumptions are being made, i.e., uh, you're going to earn 7%, but when the participant, if you look at their portfolio, they're 100% in a money market. Seven and two don't match. So whatever that calculator is telling them, they're going to be fine from a financial wellness perspective. Uh, all of us on the phone know that there's a 5% difference in return can make a big difference on whether you're going to be well or not at age 67. So with that being said, sorry I rushed in the last few minutes, but um, again, that was more summary anyways. I'm gonna now turn it over to Rick. I wanna say thank you very much for your time, your interest, and your commitment to be a better fiduciary. There are a lot of great people in this industry that can help navigate it with you, pull them in, help them work with you because you wanna make sure you're doing this right, not only for you, your participants, but for your plan going forward. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Monica, for that. Uh 
whirlwind of information. Uh, I'm sure that uh, everybody is, um, I, I guess the brain can only absorb what the rear end would let it, so it's probably about time to take that break. Uh, just as a, a couple wrap-ups, uh, remember about the fiduciary training. We'll have the instructions for that if you wish to do that. Um, again, it's a self-study course. It's about three hours. It's a final exam, and you receive the actual designation. Uh, the other thing that we'll provide everybody is the prudent practices for investment stewards. This is actually the the long version, the uh, the big thick book um, that, that goes into a, a tremendous amount of detail. Uh, lastly, uh, we hope that this has been a, a value add uh, for you. Uh, we would be happy to. We'll, Karen and I will both provide our information, and we'll be happy to do any type of, of uh, conversations or reviews. Uh, we actually uh, can can provide for you a, a somewhat of a, a benchmarking or have a benchmarking discussion. Um, with you if you if you desire that um, we'd be happy to help so with that I'll just turn it over to Karen for any closing comments thanks Rick and just to wrap things up I really just like to thank Monica for her time and uh, her presentation to us today and thank you all for participating obviously in an hour you know we can only cover this topic at a really high level um, but if you find you need to speak with uh, one of us uh, for further guidance or assistance, you know, definitely um, feel free to reach out. Um, here at Cherry Becker, we offer audit services to over 500 plans. Uh, we offer tax services. Uh, we also offer plan administration services. In addition to the investment management that Rick mentioned uh, to plans, we'd be happy to assist you. So thanks again and hope everybody has a great day.